Welcome to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast, the premier provider of leadership consulting, culture shaping, and senior level executive search services. Every day, we're privileged to talk with fascinating people who are shaping the future through their leadership and vision. Each episode, you'll hear a different perspective from thought leaders and innovators. Thanks for listening to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. Hello, I'm Scott Snyder a partner at Hydric and Struggles leading our digital innovation practice for our Hydric Consulting. And today's podcast, I'm speaking with Adrian Gore, CEO and founder of Discovery Limited. Adrian launched Discovery in South Africa in 1992 as a private health insurer. Since then, Discovery has evolved into a diversified and multinational financial services group. Adrian, welcome and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It's a real pleasure. Adrian, you're a pioneer of business disruption. Back in the 90s, what triggered you to found Discovery and therefore revolutionize the whole insurance sector? You know, if you go back to the 90s in South Africa, it was the time of the of essentially the fall of apartheid and the rise of democracy under Nelson Mandela. The key issue, you know, healthcare and health insurance is, is kind of a microcosm of of the environment, of the of the total environment, and I think you see in most countries, and finding a way to to offer sustainable access to healthcare for people as as the government shifted its money to the broad base of all South Africans was a very difficult thing to do. The South African environment had terrible levels and still does have terrible levels of disease burden. Uh, HIV AIDS the highest in the world. We have too few doctors. So, you know, kind of doctors serving the population are even the private sector, probably one third or one quarter uh, of, of developed countries. And then the government, rightly so, had a, a kind of obsession with an egalitarian system. In other words, insurance shouldn't exclude pre-existing conditions. You shouldn't rate people based on their risk factors, very much like Obamacare. So the environment was going through considerable change during that time. And I was kind of intent with a, a small team on building a health insurer that would bring in a much more sound way of funding healthcare, in effect. I guess our insight was that because of all of these factors, the only way that you could offer health insurance on a sustainable basis was to try and make people healthier. In other words, reduce the demand uh, for healthcare. You know, the American system at that stage was about managed care, in other words, controlling the supply side, uh, which we had too few doctors to do, and other systems worked on risk rating, which we couldn't do by law. So we, we started out with this very simple uh, I think simple but profound purpose, make people healthier. And that was the purpose of the organization. It has it is, it is become a, an important battlecraft for us. So long before the idea of purpose was around, discovery is built on this purpose of make, making people healthier. And the, the initial manifestation quite soon after we started was the concept of vitality, incentivizing people to do healthy things and somehow integrating that into the price of their health insurance. And uh, that was really, Scott, the start of our uh, that was kind of the evolution of the business, and it's taken us on the most remarkable journey around really pioneering the concept of, of behavioral change, uh, of building what we call today shared value insurance. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. Yeah, and what's really cool is not only did you start with a burning platform in your market and society, um, you kind of latched onto this idea of of uh, doing doing well by doing good, right? And uh, that's what's exciting. And it was one of the reasons uh, we were so attracted to you guys as a case study for the book, uh, Goliath's Revenge, which will be out this month. And in that book, um, as you know, we talk about six rules around innovation and, and transforming your company. The first is aiming for step change outcomes for your customers. The second being balance, balancing everyday little eye innovation with big eye disruptive innovation. Uh, the third being using data as currency. The fourth is building ecosystems with innovators uh, outside your normal walls. The fifth being valuing talent over technology. And the last one, uh, which I know is very close to you, is reframing your purpose uh, to be meaningful and to fuel innovation. Um, As you think about those rules, um, is there one that's closest to you or that you get most excited about or, or relates most to your journey at Discovery? Look, I think they're all, you know, if, you know, if I, I go through them, I've, I've, I've been through a book, uh, which I think is excellent. I think that if you go through them, I think the issue of purpose, the, the last one, you know, what happened to us is the is three, we had this purpose of make people healthier and three trends uh, globally made made something that's a very local, 
uh, local business in South Africa globally relevant was one was technology just became a massive enabler in, in health care, in insurance, in fintech and all of that stuff. The, the other is purpose became an issue. So most companies you know, were searching around for having a purpose that wasn't necessarily in many cases authentic. I think, as I said, was from the get-go. But the critical issue for us that I think you know, helped us frame and reframe the purpose all along was, was the, the idea that risk has changed dramatically in insurance markets. So you know, when I, I, I studied to be an actuary decades ago, most of the risk we priced for was pre-existing conditions, you know, infectious diseases, people had a certain proclivity for certain kinds of illness. But the idea of understanding behavior was not well known. And, and you know, as we've learned more about behavioral economics, we know now that three simple choices drive 50% of deaths. You know, smoking, poor nutrition, poor physical activity lead to four conditions that drive 50 to 60% of all mortality and 80% of the disease burden. So, you know, these three things coalesced that made our purpose something that was just something very local into something that was globally relevant and allowed us to build a, a model of shared value insurance of really saying to, to virtually every insurer the idea of baking behavioral change into your business, pricing your risk on that basis dynamically and giving people incentives and value for doing that was at, at kind of the heart of, of the purpose evolving into something that was really uh, just as uh, an idea into something that really was globally relevant. And I, I think, you know, I hope I'm misreading your, your six rules, but the first rule about a, a step change, I mean, the value proposition we are trying to get is the most profound, make people live longer and healthier. I think, I think the insurance industry that can often be seen as boring has quite a unique attribute that we monetize better health. So when people are healthier or they live longer, that makes us more profitable. So we're kind of a unique actor in the environment where we can – Use that power to get change and make people live longer, share the value with them. So the step change we're getting is we make people live longer. I mean, there's nothing, I think, more important than that. So our data shows remarkable effects on people engaging in our vitality structures and what that does to life expectancy, their sickness level. So I, I may be being, I hope I'm not being loose with your rules. I think they're all relevant to us, but I certainly think the evolution and framing of the purpose from something that was kind of an idea to something that's repeatable, scalable, and globally relevant. And then I think the the value proposition, the, the step change for our customers, is taking something that is traditionally a very transactional business that you buy something and claim on to something that actually makes you healthier and live longer. So those two, for me, are the most, I think, the most relevant. Well, it's interesting because in the book, we talk about a Parthenon with the six rules. And, and uh, it's it's ironic that you point out the purpose is at the base. It's the foundation. If you don't have that, you're not going to energize and galvanize people around innovation and moving the company. And, and the step change outcome, your, your direction, what you're trying to do is at the top. And uh, it sounds like you guys have been very effective at using that to really power all the other things, take advantage of technology, things like wearables and some of the power and technology to help consumers manage their health better. Um, when you think about discovery today and how it's evolved 25 years, um, you know, where do you see yourself right now and where do you see uh, the company going? Well, look, I, th I think, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful. We've come, a, we've come a long way. Today we're in 19 countries. We have 15 million customers. I think we partner some of the best companies globally, from Ping On to AIA to John Hancock to General Riley, Sumit Thomas. We, we're in all these different markets. Um, and I think the, the, the idea of shared value insurance in our model is becoming seen as one of the core ways of, of kind of how financial services can be meaningful. Um, but what I'm quite excited about is the truth of it is it's, it's embryonic. I mean, we're kind of scratching the surface. The potential is so big, you know. This idea of three, four, fifty, uh, you know, three behaviors lead to 50% of mortality. It's the same in how people drive motor cars, you know, you know, their motor vehicle risk. It's the same in banking, which we are moving into where just a few behaviors drive most of financial difficulty and the default risk. So there's kind of a strand of DNA around behavior that runs through many of the financial services sectors. Um, and therefore, we've come a long way, but I see us going into adjacencies like banking and property and casualty insurance, which we're doing very successfully. But then I think growing with our partners globally. So um, we've just rolled out internationally with our partners this pledge of making 100 million people healthier um, together with our partners, which you know I think cover nearly 30% of the covered lives globally. We have that ability to do that. So. I think we've come a long way, Scott, but the truth is I, I do think that the, the movement is kind of embryonic. 
Yeah, it is a it is a, a sea change, and part of that's empowered uh, consumers, like you talked about. Um, somehow, you guys have managed to crack the code on behavior change, something that people have been trying to do for decades in many different industries, from weight loss to driving to you know financial services. Um, what's the secret? How did you guys go about doing that and, and maybe uh, share some of those insights with, with the audience? You know, I, listen, I think uh, my view is I think we've been quite lucky. We, we started out with this very simple hunch around if you incentivize people to, if you provide a financial incentive, people would, would change. The first iteration of our business was around just giving people big discounts into aspirational health clubs if they wanted to go into discounts and things like food, yep. flights. We didn't know at that stage, and only over the last kind of two decades, there's real insight into behavioral economics, this idea that people are irrational, they discount the future, they, they want some gratification, all of these behavioral biases that we're learning about. So to an extent, I think we tapped into behavioral economics, and as that science has grown, we've used a lot of our data and, and learnings from that to make sure that the incentives are properly structured, that we, that we understand behavior change in a very profound way, and we structure things very, very carefully. I think we've used data very well. But fundamentally, I think we've tried to make our products intuitive and simple. You know, do healthy things, whether it's how you drive, how you manage your money, and earn vitality points, get a status, and get rewarded for it. And across a very broad spectrum of people, we've, we've learned how to get behavior change. We've done a lot of work with Apple around physical activity. We launched in London recently a global study together with RAND, Europe around change, just the profound effect that behavior change has on physical activity. So we've kind of had a multifaceted approach to behavior change, um, and it is working. It, it's not a simple process. It's not, it's not foolproof, but we, we are shifting populations, I think. I think that's really the story here is that it wasn't easy. And, and now I think, uh, as you pointed out, behavioral economics is much more uh, of viewed as something that businesses can leverage, not in not in some back office or uh, the art of just data scientists. Uh, absolutely, you know, and things like loss aversion, you know, people how people are motivated by potential loss and how you can build that into benefit structures. All of that stuff is is now backed by a lot of data that we have, so we can see the effect of this stuff. And uh, I mean, I think it's remarkably exciting. So um, you guys have been a disruptor in your space and, and some adjacent segments already around insurance. How do you keep that uh, attitude or mindset of being a disruptor to make sure your company doesn't become complacent uh, or you know basically satisfied with where you are and, and continue to disrupt not only your market but others? How do you keep that mindset and culture in the company? Um, that's, a, that's a tough question. I, to an extent, I have a few thoughts. I mean, I think emotion discovery is, has been grown organically by the team from the get-go. So we've, we, we've only known this cycle of innovation. We don't know anything else. We've been on this treadmill for 25 years, and there's a cadence to what we're doing. So I think there's a, a particular style that we've taken, and the entire team is, is in a cycle of continuously focusing on improving the model. But I would say the other issue is that we are in a very, very sophisticated industry globally, and therefore, because these things are highly relevant, there's just considerable competitive force all the time. And therefore, I think we're pretty clear, if we cannot keep our models and our data and our, all of our programs at the cutting edge, uh, there's real competitive threat. And therefore, something that we've developed and pioneered could come back and really take us out. So there's a, a real, I think, fear of, of competition. But, but I mean, I, I think probably the most exciting force is just the results of self-motivating. You know, we've kind of seen the incredible effect on health. We've moved into into the banking space now around trying to incentivize people to manage money better and how you can build it into the banking space. So there's kind of a natural adjacency movement. And then we're working with our partners across the world. So all of this is, there's nothing about it that's business as usual. This is continual use of data, uh, continual innovation all over the place to get, to get results. But ironically, as we evolve, uh, I think the irony is that we do more of the core purpose. I think most companies, as they get bigger, tend to diverge from their core purpose. We can't, we are learning more about it, you know, doing it better and better. So we're on a cycle here. Yeah. And it seems like if you strip all the other stuff away, you know, purpose is something that you can't just make happen overnight. It's something that's ingrained into the company. And, and that is in many ways, your competitive advantage that it fuels you uh, along with 
data and your ability to learn and, and amass more expertise, but technology is always going to change. But those things are things that become more sustainable. Uh, so it's great to see discovery leverage those. I, I totally agree. I think, I think purpose has got to be authentic. You know, I think you've got to, re it's got to be something that's core to the organization because it, it, it kind of, when you, if you go through complexities or difficulties or a new business model, always coming back to the purpose and the values kind of give you the, so we develop considerable amount of models around the operating model, the financial model, all of it is pinned on the purpose. So I, I strongly, strongly agree. So you've gone through quite a journey in your own life, right? You started in more traditional industry. You went out on your own as an entrepreneur. Uh, you've grown a fairly exciting, innovative company. Um, are there one or two lessons along your own career journey that you'd like to share with the audience or people thinking about their own uh, progression if they want to be innovators? Again, just going back to purpose, I think that unless you have a, unless you believe strongly in the purpose you're following, I think the entrepreneurship or the effort feels kind of hollow. So my sense is I think you do have to have some, some value to add to society behind that entrepreneurial spirit. I think on my journey, I've always been a great believer in optimism. I really have been. I think that building something requires continual challenge, and I think you do have to see a way through that. And then I'm a great believer that innovation need not be at the expense of prudence. In other words, I think you can you can innovate in a way that leads to better financial results. I think often people often people make the assumption that being innovative is kind of being out there and risky. I don't think it is. I think if you look at the innovations we've done, typically they, they manifest in better risk results, you know, better financial results. So I'm a great believer in innovation, but I'm I'm a believer that innovation leads to leads to better financial results and more soundness and sustainability. Um, and then I, I guess, and I hope this doesn't sound trite, but I'm a great believer in just simple honesty. I think that uh, if you're building a business on the right values, it will be sustainable. I think if you're doing the wrong values, you know, we'll get caught out eventually. So we build a pretty simple business on values, but a complex business actuarially and financially. Um, and it's been a fantastic ride. I'd encourage anyone if they to do that if you can. It's a wonderful honor. And it sounds like um, if you have the opportunity uh, and and not only not everybody has this, but if you're a leader, especially your personal values and views have to align incredibly well with your company. And it sounds like in your case, uh, the ones you outline now are very much match what discovery is all about. For sure, I think that you know you don't need complexity. I think simple, simple, honest values that inspire a team is what you need that are authentic. And I found truthfully that um, in leading a team, it's it's purpose and values that inspire them. They're inspired by purpose, not by earnings per share and financial results. That's for shareholders and stakeholders to an extent. I think that people are really inspired by by social impact that's for the good of society. And uh, I think if you can do that, you can. You don't have to be a. I'm not suggesting. You, I'm not a great believer in born leaders. I think that if you've got a purpose and you do it well, you will lead well. It's as simple as that. I think. Yeah, and. Um... We're excited to have you as a case study in the book, and I think discovery is proof that even in the most established industries, um, companies can reinvent and, and change the paradigm, right, and, and change the value proposition for the market for both the good of themselves and also their customers, and I think you guys are uh, living proof of that. Thank you for your time, Adrian, and uh, we look forward to hearing more exciting developments from discovery in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. To make sure you don't miss more future shaping ideas and conversations, please subscribe to our channel on the podcast app. And if you're listening via LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube, why not share this with your connections? Until next time.